Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. Um, welcome to Marcus Dev's professorial inaugural lecture. I'm <laughs> Okay, it's going to be like that, apparently. Um, um, I'm Ben Lauderdale, professor and head of Department of Political Science. Um, so pro professorial inaugural lectures are a, a formal opportunity to celebrate the research and careers of colleagues uh, who have been newly promoted or hired as a UCL professor. So today we're here to recognize and learn more about the work of Professor Marcus Dev, who was promoted to Professor of Public Management in 2021. You might notice that was two years ago. Um, Mark has had his inaugural lecture scheduled at least twice in the previous two years. Um, we had a debate earlier about exactly how many times we've rescheduled this lecture. Um, it was canceled at least once because of COVID and at least once because of industrial action, and we've lost count of exactly how many times of each. Um, so Mark has had a long time to prepare for today, and I trust it'll be a good show. Um, Mark um, has been at UCL for a decade, uh, joining us as a lecturer in 2013, gaining promotion to associate professor in 2016, and to professor in 2021. This swift sequence of promotions reflects his outstanding work in all aspects of his job, in research and teaching and contributing to the running of the department and university, and in his engagement with the broader world. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of these in turn before I hand over to, to Mark. So Mark's research has contributed to our understanding of how organizational forms matter in public sector service provision and to our understanding of how to motivate government employees. He has published extensively in the top journals in public management as well as in two Cambridge University Press books. Um, he has served as an editor for the journal Local, Local Government Studies as well as on the editorial boards of at least five other journals. Um, his research is methodologically diverse. He's used evidence from original surveys, survey experiments, lab experiments, field experiments with civil servants, elite interviews with high-level policymakers, and various uh, analyses of secondary data. Mark is an excellent classroom teacher, and he has ably taught our students um, on the public policy and public administration programs over the last decade. Um, back before we abolished comparable module level teaching surveys, Mark's students reliably rated his teaching extremely highly. I presume he's continued to deliver that quality education um, past the end of the data set. Um, he's been particularly involved in supporting students um, who develop ambitious projects to engage critically with the work of organizations like the OECD, DEFRA, UNICEF, and the World Bank. Um, Mark has been involved specifically with our department's Master's in Public Administration since its creation, serving multiple periods as program director. Um, he's worked to secure and maintain scholarships for students on that program and to recruit diverse students with a range of work and public management experiences. In between his terms as program director, he's contributed to the, to the department's engagement with student concerns more generally. This has included work with staff and students to support remote teaching during COVID, and also engaging with students over several years to find ways to improve their experience in the department. I suspect that Mark will say more about his motivations for his work, but it should come as no surprise that someone whose research is on public management is deeply committed to working with pub public sector ent entities to improve how they implement policy and manage public sector staff. Um, Mark has had a large number of advisory roles, particularly in partnership with various parts of the Catalan government, including the Catalan Health Agency, the Catalan Tax Agency, and supporting a major reform of the prison system that necessitated the largest movement of public se servants in recent Catalan history. His work as a visiting professor at Assad in Barcelona has provided academic connections for our department and a platform for his external work in Catalonia. Before I hand off to Mark, let me quickly explain the order of our operations for this evening. Mark will give his inaugural lecture. After that, Christian Schuster, who is a professor of public management in our department and a frequent collaborator with Mark, will give an appreciation of Mark's work. After the appreciation, we will adjourn, and you're invited to join us at a drinks reception in, in Bentham House. Um, there'll be a group of people sort of moving over there after, after the, the lecture concludes. Um, the con convention is that there are no questions from the audience at an inaugural lecture. Um, it's meant to be a celebration of the work of the professor and a brief respite from the incisive questioning that they've received up to this point in their career. Um, that said, you can always try to track down Mark later at the reception or by email and give him a piece of your mind then. 
Um, so please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Marcus Stev to deliver his inaugural talk. Wow, I'm, I'm nervous. I haven't been nervous in a long time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It was hard for me to believe because we had to postpone it a number of times. And until I have finished, probably I would not really believe that I have uh, really done this. Um, I think this is an opportunity for me to explain all of you a little bit about my motivations to do the type of work that I do and also to show you a piece of the work that I do. But I think Ben mentioned that we are here to celebrate and to learn. I'm going to try to focus more on the first and on the second, okay, just for you to, to set your expectations. Um, really all of my work has to do somehow is related with how to enhance the quality of our public uh, services. And my personal story is a bit of a, you know, it's, sorry, it's the first time that I'm presenting. <laughs> it's a little bit of a strange trip. And actually, if you, for some reason, read my CV, you will notice that particularly the first years of my academic life were a little bit, well, difficult to understand probably from the outside. So let me give you some reason behind. I, when I was young, I used to play chess, and that was my thing. I was a chess player. I thought I was way better than what I really was, probably, but I used to train every afternoon, so that's the sort of thing that I would do after school. I would go to a chess center and I will train. If you've ever trained uh, on chess, it's extremely boring. <laughs> extremely boring, you know, like you don't really go there and play, but you play certain moves with certain, you know, I mean, it, the whole thing is a little bit boring. So after some time, my family realized that I was getting as they put it, I was getting a bit weird socially. <laughs> and they thought, you know, we need to get him out of, you know, like he's not good enough to really make a career. And this is obviously making him a bit strange. So we, we, need, to find, <laughs> we need to find a solution. And then uh, near my home, there was a rugby field, really close to where we used to live. Uh, and they had a brilliant idea that I could play rugby. You know, from chess to rugby, they thought it was a natural movement. So there I was, uh, 15 years old, I think I was, and I started playing rugby. And I loved it, right? Uh, I really, really like it. So much so that I was reasonably good at it. Not many people play rugby in Catalonia or in Spain. So it was reasonably easy to become, you know, I become what at the time was called something like a professional athlete, even though I had very little of professional and very little of athlete. But, uh, you know, I, all of a sudden, I thought, I'm going to be a professional athlete for my whole life. Right? This is going to be my career. I'm going to be a rugby player. Um, and I was supposed to be a medical doctor. I had prepared the tests and everything. And then when I went up to the Catalan government and I registered myself for a uh, university degrees, uh, somehow I decided to register for sports science. So I went back home and I told my family, you know, I'm going to do sports science. And they didn't like it very much. You know. Um, I had a pretty good grade from high school, and my father was telling me, like, why on earth would you do a sports science? I mean, you were supposed to be a medical doctor. What's wrong with you? My mother was telling him, let the kid do what he likes, you know, in a, in a very kind way. So finally, they allowed me to do sports science. And, uh, well, things that happened in life, I got a really bad injury in the first year. So I had to stop playing rugby, and I become basically a full-time student. And I realized that I didn't quite enjoy that much sports science. I like practicing sports, but not really studying them. So I went to my family and said, I would like to change and go back to study medicine. And my father told me, no, you're not going to quit anything. If you want to study medicine, you know, do both at the same time. But you're not quitting. And probably he was afraid that I would just quit anything. He probably was probably right. Um, so I, I look at the schedules and it was impossible because, you know, both uh, undergraduates had very heavy practices. So I had to do something online. So I decided to do psychology, okay? And after that, I did a Master of Science in Health, Health Science. And after that, I realized that I made a, <laughs> I make a statistical mistake in my final dissertation that the committee didn't so. And I was furious with that. So I decided that I would take a, a basically a master's on statistics. Thanks God I didn't do it. And instead, I did another program called a Master of Research in Management Sciences because apparently it was a new thing in something called a business school which I had no idea what it was. Uh, but it seemed fun. So I joined that. 
And then I realized that there is this whole world called management within business schools, which I pretty much like. And I realized that all of a sudden, being good at, at my studies was extremely challenging because everyone was super smart. So I had to put a lot of effort. Needless to say, this program was in English and I had no clue about, you know, still have difficulties nowadays after 10 years at UCL, so imagine, okay? And that led to a PhD in management science. And the one thing that I've always, that probably connects all of this, is that at the end of the day, all my dissertations and most of my essays had to do with the public sector. Probably because my father was a politician, my mother was a government employee, a teacher, and all of their families were actually government employees, different sorts, right? So I was basically raised hearing some of the stories that they were telling, saying, you know, we had more resources. My father was to, used to work in immigration. He was the head of immigration in Barcelona. And he used to complain about how difficult it was. Because the better he did his job, the higher the demand that the city had to, you know, uh, face this challenge. And they were both very left-oriented. So at home, basically, we used to talk about the need of more resources for better public services. So that's basically what I've devoted all my life. And when I finished my PhD, uh, a friend of mine told me, there is this position at UCL, you should apply. And my answer was, I, you know, it's pointless because I don't know anyone at UCL. That's Spanish mentality uh, 15 years ago, 13 years ago, right? If you don't have friends, they're not gonna hire you. So I apply here. Um, and somehow, probably for a mistake of some sort, um, I got a job offer. I still remember when I got the phone call. David Hudson used to be the head of the department at the time. Sorry, David Cohen, not David Hudson. And uh, he made me an offer, and I didn't even thought that that could be negotiated. So I just said, yeah, great, <laughs> okay. Uh, with that salary now, probably I would not have the right to work in the UK, apparently, with <laughs> you. So you can imagine, right? Now, uh, this is what brought me to UCL. Um, but what has really allowed me to do what I've been able to do in the recent years have really been all the organizations that very kindly have supported my work. Uh, they're mainly from Catalonia and from Spain. There is nothing that Catalans like more than to steal money from the Spanish government, so I've been very active on that. Uh, and pretty successfully, I have to say. But really, the thing that has made more of a difference in, in my career, by far. It's not the funding, nor the institutions, really. But it's all the co-authors that I've been very lucky to work with. Some of them are here today. Uh, you don't know how difficult it is to convince all of these people to put your name on a paper without doing anything. So it's challenging. Some of them have even repeated that. So I, I really owe most of what I am today academically to my colleagues. And, you know, besides the papers, besides all of this, I would recommend to anyone working in academia at an earlier stage, this is really what is going to stay with you the longest, okay? Some of them will become friends. Some of them will speak after you in your inaugural. So it's really, that's really what mattered, okay? Now, um, let me show you. Uh, a taste of my work, and I'm here today to focus on public and private sector collaboration, okay? You know that we are moving uh, from this concept of government to something called governance. You know that governance has as many definitions as people trying to explain it, right? Um, the way that I understand this is we are moving from an idea, this Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes, this is my, my aim at talking something that resembles to political science, okay, Thomas Hobbes. Um, but the idea is, you know, the government is no longer probably seen as something very powerful. But instead, is something that it's much weaker in a way, or much more at least um, affected by what citizens and voters really want, right? And now we have this idea of a government that we ask them to create public values, so to do things that really matter, we ask them to do this efficiently, with efficiency, right? Value for money, etc. And we have a start thinking about the idea of quality. So now we want more public services with better quality. Now, <clears throat> one of the problems that we have with this model is that 
if you think about public services, public services are like a basket in which you know, politicians and policymakers have very little trouble at putting more services on, right? They just put more. But if you think about public services that recently have stopped being public services, you'll probably find very few examples around, okay? Why? Because obviously it gets you more votes to add things to the you know, services than to take them out. And as a result of that, we have ended up with a society, and this applies to every OECD country, that demands very good health services, demands, for example, that we take care of our elderly people, and you know that we have the habit of living for longer, right? And this means that the expenses that degenerate are going to also be higher. We ask for good infrastructure, good education, police services, you know, trains, airports, judiciary systems, cleaning services. We ask and we ask and we ask. But if we look at the resources that we are using to pay for this, well, it's getting very challenging, right? People is not really willing to pay more taxes in most countries, most people, okay? And then governments have tried to find ways to really be able to finance this. In Spain, for example, our previous government decided to use the money that we had saved for pensions. Okay? Other countries, and they emptied our pockets in a, in a way, other countries have decided to use money, for example, from the European Union. Yeah? But what we see is a huge tension, a huge imbalance between the service demands and the resources that we have to provide these services. One particular way to try to balance this is what two colleagues of mine, Xavier Mendoza and Alfred Bernays, coined as the relational state. The relational state is a framework that has really guided most of my work. It's basically the idea that public services are not simply the responsibility of the public sector, and instead should be the responsibility of governments, private organizations, nonprofits, and I would also add citizens. Okay? This collaboration between governments, nonprofits, private organizations, and citizens is what should help us to balance this idea between service demands and the resources that we have to meet them. Now, what are the different roles of these actors? Well, first of all, governments need to act as leaders. At the end of the day, if we're talking about a public service, we have to realize that the main role that governments have is to lead the implementation, the design of these services, okay? Citizens need to be entrepreneurs, and more importantly, they need to be co-responsible. So if you don't want to pay more taxes, for example, to make sure that your streets are clean, at the very least, you should not you know, throw garbage there, right? And we will see different options of co-production. Nonprofit organizations need to be economically sustainable. Why do we mean by this? There are ba basically two very different business models for NGOs. One would be the classic big NGOs that we all know that basically lead, live out of uh, the resources that they can get from private donors, some public donors sometimes, yeah? But then we have another model in which NGOs decide to compete directly with the market through products. And then by competing with the market, they raise the resources that they need to do the social activities that they think are important. In Catalonia, for example, we have a very nice case of a company called La Fageda, owned by a guy called Cristobal Colón and Colón, which had a, you know, funny parents probably, um, that basically produces yogurts. But what they are really doing is they only hire people with mental disabilities. And as a result of that, in the whole region where they operate, not a single person with mental disabilities is unemployed. So they are really an NGO. But if you look at the yogurts, you cannot really see nowhere what they are really doing. And when you ask this guy, but why are you not promoting this if this is something very nice? He says, because I don't want people to buy these yogurts to help us. I want to buy them. I want people to buy them because they taste good. That's the real difference, okay? Private organizations need to be socially responsible. And this is something that we keep saying, and it's difficult to see it, really. I don't think some people would say that the only reason why the private sector exists is to make profit, and I would tend to agree in most cases with this sentence. But we have also seen that the public sector can give the private sector things that are interesting, like, for example, 
very stable long-term contracts, which probably doesn't give the overall revenue of more risky options, but it will certainly give the private company a very stable source of revenue that they could use. What is the change in mindsets? Well, we're moving from the idea of welfare state, where there is a clear split between the public and the private sector, to something where what really matters is this collaboration. Yeah? From this idea that governments were very, very powerful to governments that are much more focused on social needs. Okay? There was a strong preference for monopolistic provision of public services, and now we are moving towards empowering citizens and introducing market competition for public services. In the welfare state, we could say that government meant the spending, and now the idea is that governance really means mobilizing the resources of as many stakeholders as possible. Okay? What does it mean? I don't like to talk about privatization. For me, privatization is when a service is no longer considered a public service. When what we have is the inclusion of the private sector into the delivery of a public service, I like to talk about collaboration, externalization, contracting out, partnerships, etc. We see high levels of decentralizations. We see high levels of consultation with social groups. We see that most users of public services don't really know whether the organization that is providing a service is public or private. And at some point, we could discuss whether UCL is public or private, because it took me a while, actually, to find out. And according to some definitions, well, let's say that the answer is not very clear, OK? Still very much perform centered. And the idea that you know, we're not really claiming, as the new public management advocate for some time, that government should be run as private sector organizations, but there are certainly some management skills, some management frameworks, some management tools that could be very useful to, at the end of the day, provide better public services. The idea here is that you know, before the 80s, we had big governments. Then with Margaret Thatcher, with Reagan, the fashion was to have a small governments. And I think that what we need nowadays is, you know, I don't really care about the size of the government, but I really think that government should be strong, should have managerial capacities to really be able to lead these collaborations, this relational state. Okay? With this framework, I had to try to decide what to do with my career. So I started trying to answer questions like when, how, and why collaboration would make sense. So let me just show you very quickly uh, some of the studies that I've done under these concepts of when, how, and why should we collaborate. Okay. When should we collaborate? Uh, actually, the next couple of slides are part of what I presented in my job talk at UCL 10 or 11 years ago. Okay. So it's nice to see them again. One of my first works, which was part of my PhD, was to study what were the determinants of collaboration. So why should governments collaborate? We know from the literature that there are certain environmental factors and certain organizational factors that would push governments to collaborate. So for example, uh, the bigger the organization is, the more likely it is to collaborate, right? There are certain things like if they have positive past experiences with collaboration, obviously they're more likely to collaborate. But you didn't need to come to UCL to learn that. That's very standard. Um, but among all these studies, one thing that I was missing was, what about policymakers? What about public managers? Does it matter who you put in charge of these organizations? So a big part of my PhD had to do with figuring out what is the effect of the characteristics of public managers that you put uh, on top of these agencies to basically decide whether projects should be done alone or in collaboration. And what we found was basically that environmental variables matter, that organizational variables also matter, but funny enough, what mattered the most were certain individual characteristics of public managers. Actually, the variable with the largest effect is the age of the manager. Younger managers tend to collaborate more. When I present these results to older students, usually executive students, they react saying, but that might not be true, right? And I say, well, I'm not really measuring the success of the collaboration. I'm just measuring whether they want to collaborate, whether they engage actually in collaborations or not. So maybe they collaborate a lot, but they do it really badly, badly because they don't have experience yet. We don't know. Okay? 
But what we really saw was that there are factors like, for example, self-development. If they train, for example, if they get out of their offices, they can meet potential partners and they end up collaborating more. If you're doing a PhD in a business school and you find out that training is good for managers, you get a bonus, okay? which was my case. After this, one of the other big questions that we had was, what happens when elections come? Do we really see an effect the year that that government is having an election? Is people more or less willing to collaborate, or maybe it doesn't matter, right? So what we did in this study was trying to figure out whether there is something called opportunistic behavior. And we took a sample of Spanish municipalities from 2002 to 2014, so a pretty large um, data set. And we tried to see what happens before and after elections, and what happens on the very year that we have elections. Okay? What we saw is that in pre-election years, policymakers don't want to engage in collaborations because they are afraid that maybe a local newspaper is going to say, oh, this government is privatizing the water. And that would be bad for them. Right? Now, the idea here is this was a clear effect, and there are two main arguments to explain this. One could think, well, you know, collaborations are managerially very challenging. If you're at the last year of your office, you don't want probably to engage in something that might be very difficult for the next person. The other argument is you're really afraid of the electoral effects that this is going to have. So what we did was try to see whether there was any difference between the political party that was in charge. And we differentiated between right and left political parties. What we found was that these results are particularly strong for left political parties. So when left political parties are in power, they are very much against collaboration when we have elections. Okay? Right-oriented political parties, still you will see a significant effect, but much less so. And the funny thing is that we then ran another study asking citizens whether they actually care about this or not. And in most cases, what we found is that what people really want are good public services. They are not that interested, most of them, in whether these services are provided by the public or the private sector, as long as you know, tubes work, the streets are clean, etc. Yeah? How should then we manage uh, these collaborations? Most of the work that we've done has really tried to delve into how we can train public managers and policymakers to be better at managing these collaborations. One of the things that we've seen is that collaborating is actually very difficult. It's very, very challenging. It can be very good, but managerially, it's very difficult to do. Why? Because you really have two sectors that have very different goals, very difficult to align these objectives. And in some cases, you can agree on the objective of the collaboration, but then there will be secondary objectives of both parties, the public and the private actors, that will actually clash while the project advances. Okay? Some authors have warned us, this was 20 years ago, that public-private partnerships would be difficult to implement. And we actually were one of the first showing some empirical evidence on some of these challenges. At the end, after these studies, what we ended up concluding was that we are probably trying to mix oil and water. So what I like to explain to my students is what are the skills that someone would need to write both of these beasts. By the way, I don't imply any of these animals to any sector. Just, I just like it, the picture. Okay? Through the different studies that we've done, we've realized that in public-private sector collaborations, we're going to have tensions between the public and the private sector, for example, when trying to develop objectives that are oriented to the public at large, and therefore creating this idea of public value. This is particularly the case in public-private joint ventures. Not so much in what we would call contracting out initiatives in which you simply write a contract to run, for example, a highway right, for the next 30, 40, 60 years, in which things are actually a little bit easier to manage. But when you have a joint venture that is jointly governed by the public and the private sector, some of these tensions are actually much more challenging. Hmm? More tensions, for example, with the lack of managerial autonomy of some public managers. In some cases, we would see how policymakers and public managers would say, yeah, I want to do this, but it's not up to me. 
right? Even though I agree with you in this negotiation, even though I see the benefits of this, I don't really have the freedom to act on it. And then we will also see how sometimes public managers would have challenges, would have tensions, because the private sector wants to take you know, too big of a piece of this cake. And this is something that we have seen, for example, in South European cases, where due to the lack of capacity of the public sector, sometimes private actors have really taken too big of a cake here. Okay? Uh, and that's something that, you know, while I argue that public and private sector collaborations are very good, I think that if we don't have a strong public sector able to manage face-to-face -face here the private providers, the public sector is going to lose. Okay? One of the things that we found were very important, I don't know if you follow uh, Deidre McCloskey, an emeritus uh, economic professor from Chicago, but she has this uh, great notion that what really matters, she's an economist and she says that what really matters are words and that everything is rhetoric. One of the things that we have realized with uh, public and private sector collaborations is the importance of building a good rhetoric for citizens to understand the benefits of these collaborations. She's well known for a trilogy that it's called the bourgeois era, where she basically defends that uh, the industrial revolution didn't really happen because of a change in a manufacturing process, but really because someone coined the concept of middle class. And then if you were poor, if you were to work really hard, you would become middle class, not high class, don't go that hard, okay? But you could be something called middle class. I very much recommend this book. We applied this to a public-private collaboration for water services in the city of Barcelona. And we were working with a, a large a private corporation, very large private corporation from Spain. And at the end, I was telling them, look, um, your communication policies are really, really poor because people is not aware that actually this service is very well managed. This was a few years ago when we had all these debates about remunicipalizing certain public services. I say that to the CEO and to the uh, head of communications, which didn't took my comment very kindly. And he said, but we have created a web page where we put all the information about our performance, so it's there, you can just check it. But I was trying to explain, you know, creating a web page means nothing. You know, my aunt is not going to go to your web page to see how well you're doing. You have to actively manage this rhetoric. Okay, this narrative. And that's something that I think still the public sector and the private sector needs to do much better. We then did another study looking at what particular management actions would matter for the outcomes and the outputs of networks, of collaborations that were informal. And what we found was that trust was one of the main factors that really matters. Trust between the two organizations. Now we want to delve a little bit more on this and differentiate that you can trust the organization or you can trust just the manager that you're dealing with or you can maybe trust a lot the project. But we need to differentiate between these different types of trust and how they might have actually affect the final project, okay? Now, why? Why should we collaborate? We have also done a number of studies, especially with uh, some colleagues from economics departments uh, looking at whether is it better or not to collaborate. Should we do things alone? Is this actually, you know, the idea of the relational state might sound appealing, but does it actually work in practice? What we have seen first was what happens when you try to compare the efficiency of public services through different organizational forms. And what we did here was look at four different options. Services that were basically uh, directly provided by the public sector through a public agency, okay? No private sector involvement whatsoever. Then we look at public corporations, so still the public sector alone, but operating with more managerial freedom than a public agency. And then cases of mixed public corporations, both with minority public ownership and with majority public ownership. And we analyzed 10 different services, sewerage, social services, sport facilities, etc. okay, from 2014 to 2017 on a rather large sample of municipalities. 
And what we found was quite interesting because what we found is that there is really no evidence that corporatization will bring any cost advantages, which very much goes against what the literature will suggest. So giving more freedom to the public management, to the public uh, managers in this case and policymakers, don't really translate into more efficient public services. Actually, the least efficient organizational form was a corporation with private sector collaboration in which the private sector has a minority of shares. In other words, if you want to collaborate with the private sector and ask them to behave like you would normally do, it doesn't really work very well. Okay? Why do we think that this happens? Why do we think that what we found is actually against the literature? We think that this is because when top managers, top policy makers are appointed in these public corporations, they don't really have a strong incentive to be efficient. Nobody knows whether the organization running the tube made a profit or a loss last year. What they know is whether the tube was working well or not. So if we were now a union, and we knew this, and unions know that, and we went to, for example, negotiate a new collective agreement for our salaries, we would say we want a higher salary, or we will stop the tube. And the CEO, the manager, the policymaker would say, well, if you stop the tube, I'm gonna probably, you know, I'm gonna have, I might lose my job because I'm politically appointed. So they have a strong incentive to increase salaries rather than look for efficiency. And this leads to, at least in Spain where we measure that, public corporations that end up being more expensive, despite what the literature might said, okay? Then we look at something different, which is, well, you can be very efficient at providing a very poor service. What happens when you include quality in this service? What happens when you measure efficiency, but you also include the variable quality? And what happens when you also look at whether governments pay directly for the service to the private provider or citizens pay a fee every time that they use the service. What is the difference in terms of quality of the service and efficacy? Here we had data, again municipal data from Spain from 2014 to 2016 uh, from waste removal services and also from water services. And we were trying to differentiate between direct public service provision Externalization, so you know, the public ser service signing in contract with the private provider in which the public service pays the bill at the end of the year, okay? Or cases in which we have a private provider but we ask users to pay a fee every time that they use the service or in the case of water, for example, according to how many uh, liters of water they are using, okay? What we found here is that contracting out is less efficient than public provision when accounting for service quality. In other words, you want something cheap, you don't really care about the quality, externalizations would work very well. But if you care about the quality, the performance differences among externalizations and direct provisions are not that clear, not that large at least. Yeah? What we saw is that the case in which we could provide high quality services more efficiently, again, the difference was not that large, but if you ask me, so what's the best option? It was service quality through user fees. Even though probably policymakers are not gonna be very willing to implement these sort of measures because obviously they are not very popular, yeah? But the idea that I want you to kind of remember is externalization with public funding would work probably worse than public service provision which would work a little bit worse than externalizing with user fee funding, okay? What is next? What should we do next? Well, I, I realized that my studies have had a, a pretty good impact, a pretty significant impact among my field. Uh, but at the same time, I have the feeling that they haven't really had such a big impact among policymakers. So I think that, you know, I've uh, filled many research gaps, as we would say. I've answered many research questions, but I still have the feeling that the societal impact 
of my work could be much higher. So what I would like to do is focus precisely on having more policy impact. Maybe less studies, but hopefully with more impact. And in terms of topics, I would be interested, for example, in exploring how different innovative forms of contracting out actually can bring benefits to public services. So for example, if I was to contract out, imagine that now you were the director of a hospital. And we agree, and I'm the public sector, I say, how much would you charge me for every knee replacement? And you would say, I don't know, it's 2,000 euros. Perfect. We're going to sign a contract, and I'm going to pay you 2,000 euros every time that you perform a surgery on a knee. Perfect. But because you're very good managers, you will innovate. Your processes would be better. And after a few months, the cost of that surgery will, will go down, right? Maybe now it's 1,500. We say that collaboration brings innovation, but I usually say that this is something that stays within the private sector if we don't manage well our contracts. Why? Because if we save 500 pounds for every surgery in our contract, I'm still paying you 2,000. So you are now earning 500 plus, but for the public sector, this innovation doesn't exist. Not even probably for the user, because we are not talking about innovation in terms of the process or the product, right? So we are now seeing some innovative forms that could account for that, saying, look, if you're able to do this cheaper, we will split the difference. Or maybe we'll go 70-30 so you have a strong incentive to innovate. Okay? And I'm also interested in what is the role that citizens have within this relational state. And I'm not the first one. There is a huge co-production literature. But one of the things that we are now delving into is when is it actually good to have citizens implementing public services themselves? Are we comfortable, for example, having neighborhood watch patrols? What happens if a citizen that is part of one of these neighborhood watch patrols oversteps with someone because he or she is not very well trained? How can we hold that person accountable? Is it always good to have co-production? These are the sort of questions that we will try to answer. Okay? And I'm going to leave it here. Thank you very much for coming. It's been a, a pleasure. Okay? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm slightly too tall for this microphone. Um, it's my distinguished pleasure to provide an appreciation uh, for my colleague and co-author, Marcus Steve. Uh, I should that I first, or I first need to appreciate that I'm the last thing standing between you here and the drinks, um, so I will try to keep this short. And fortunately, Mark has been kind enough uh, to lead the kind of professional life that makes my task of appreciation here a very easy one. Let me start with the sheer numbers. Uh, Mark is, as a scholar, an absolute force of nature. He is an author who writes papers faster than most of us can read them. Um, his Google Scholar profile currently lists 77 publications. But of course, the sheer numbers matter less than academic contributions. And within the field of public administration, Mark is outstanding in the breadth of contributions he has made. He presented today on collaboration, contracting, and the relational state and the range of contributions he has made in that area. What I want to do in this appreciation is to underscore just how wide-ranging Mark's contributions have been beyond that. And I want to do that by talking about two topics that Mark's research has centrally contributed to. One of them is a perennial classic in public administration, and that is public service motivation. The other is a topic that is central to the present and future of public administration, and that is artificial intelligence. Let me start with the latter. Two of Mark's most cited papers look at artificial intelligence. And what Mark has done in particular with colleagues is to assess how governments can effectively integrate data science and artificial intelligence uh, in service delivery. And <clears throat> my voice, apologies, is gone today. Mark's work is outstanding in contributing particular evidence on how to manage this process. For instance, by, collab by governments collaborating with universities and other sectors through policy laboratories. And <clears throat> this kind of evidence on how governments can effectively integrate AI and data science into their operations is obviously crucial for governments today uh, and for governments in the future. Uh, as many of you know, there's a large 
a multi-billion pound graveyard uh, of failed attempts to integrate AI and data science uh, into governments around the world. And that has meant that the data revolution that we've seen uh, in the public sector, sorry, in the private sector in many countries has not translated into a data revolution in many public sectors. So understanding how to get this right is important both for government effectiveness and for government legitimacy, and Mark's work contributes importantly uh, in this debate. Some of Mark's other work is on public service motivation. Public service motivation is the notion that many of those who work for the public sector do so because they're motivated to serve the public, they're motivated to help others. Uh, and that's particularly important in the public sector because it's one of the unique motivators the public sector has that is easier to implement in the public sector than the private sector. And it's, of course, in the public sector harder to implement other motivators such as higher pay, for instance, it would be competitive. Uh, I've had the pleasure of witnessing Mark's mind in action in this area uh, in several joint pieces of work, including a book on motivating public employees. But beyond that, Mark has undertaken a range of empirical assessments of the antecedents and consequences of this motivation. For instance, Mark's early co-authored work has underscored uh, that this, this motivation, as measured in hundreds of surveys, in fact translates into pro-social behavior in the lab. His more recent work has looked at antecedents. For instance, who is motivated to serve society uh, and who is not? And Mark's work has shown, for instance, that there are certain personality traits, such as emotionality, for instance, which predict greater public service motivation. And understanding that, of course, matters very practically. For, for instance, when you think about how you screen for this motivation uh, when recruiting new personnel in a public sector organization. So in short, Mark is a scholar who has made outstanding contributions to a wide range of public administration debates, both substantive and methodological. He is a wonderful collaborator who, as his broad and diverse network of co-authors also underscores, is deeply appreciated by a wide range of colleagues in the discipline. But his contributions do not stop at research. Mark is also an outstanding educator, uh, be that as inaugural and long-standing director uh, of our MPA program, uh, or when teaching senior executives in governments around the world. And he's also a wonderful colleague beyond that. In our department, we have an Unsung Hero Award. And thinking about who should receive this next, I do want to volunteer one piece of information here. And that is that among Mark's lesser known contributions is picking up colleagues at the airport on the back of his motorcycle. <laughs> As I understand from secondhand sources, some colleagues have enjoyed that, others have made rather loud shrieking noises. For everyone, it was an experience. Yeah. <laughs> on, on a more serious note, and in short, public administration scholarship, teaching and practice, and our department are richer and better thanks to Mark's work. Mark, I'm grateful to have you as a colleague, as a co-author, as a friend. Allow me to close this appreciation with a quote from one of the most famous sons of Mark's hometown, Barcelona, and that is Pep Guardiola. As Pep Guardiola once put it in reference to Messi, but surely no less fitting for Mark, that guy is exceptional. Thank you so much and congratulations, Professor Esther.